Our next keynote served two terms as governor of Maryland from 2007 to 2015. Prior to that, he served two terms as mayor of Baltimore. Um, so Governor Martin O'Malley is, um, uh, here's what, what some folks have said about him, a lot of the media have said. So Time Magazine um, has one of the top five big city mayors. Um, that comes from Time Magazine. From Governing Magazine, Public Official of the Year in 2011. And uh, other magazines have said, you know, the, the, one of the best in, uh, in government today. Huffington Post, uh, O'Malley just set a, uh, set a very high bar on climate change for 2016. Um, and um, Salon, this is what a real climate plan looks like. O'Malley's bold approach sets the standard. So on behalf of Green Builder Media, uh, the partners, and um, today's sponsors, um, let's give a warm welcome to uh, Governor Martin O'Malley. Ernest, thanks very much. This is fun, isn't it? It's really cool to listen to people doing good, life-giving things, creating a new world. Did you enjoy Jeremy Rifkin? Yeah, listening to him, I thought, thank goodness I'm not crazy. Somebody else is, is seeing this. So it's really a pleasure to be with all of you. I want to uh, not only thank Ernest for his kind introduction, I want to thank Sarah for the invitation to be here with all of you at Green Builder Media. And I uh, want to make sure I have my clicker. I'm good to go. Yes, Greg? Yeah. Okay, that's the man behind the curtain. Uh, short story. Horatio Nelson Jackson is a doctor from Vermont at a medical convention in San Francisco, California. The year is 1903. And Horatio's out to dinner with a bunch of his fellow doctor buddies. And they're having a little debate, a conversation about whether or not there'll be a Im big impact from this new innovation called the horseless carriage, the car the automobile. Now all of the other doctors think that it's really not going to make much of a difference, that it's too expensive, there's not the infrastructure, cost, but Horatio thinks differently. Horatio thinks it's going to be a huge game changer and he bets them all $50 in 1903 money, $50 that he can drive a car all the way across the United States from San Francisco to New York in 90 days. And the very next day, Horatio goes out and he buys a car, a Winton. He convinces a young mechanic at the car dealership, Sewell Crocker, to go with him. And they buy a dog named Bud. And that's Sewell Crocker and Bud. There's a lot in that picture, by the way. The second day after the bet, Horatio, Sewell, and Bud are on their way, headed east towards the sunrise. And it is 1903, and get this, there are only a total of approximately 8,000 cars in the entire United States. Only 150 miles of paved roads and no highway department. Not a single highway department in any one of the states. 60 Three days later, ahead of schedule, they roll down Fifth Avenue in New York City. And they are the first people, well, two people and a dog, to travel all the way across the United States in an automobile. Now, Horatio wins the $50 bet, or the $50, and he also wins the bet that America does, in fact, change. 23 years later, this is a 1923 map. There are 8 million cars, hundreds of thousands of miles of paved roads, and a highway department in every single one of the United States. Society today, as we gather here in Orlando, is right where Horatio was, looking forward at a world that's about to be turned upside down. It's a great honor to be here with all of you at 2018 Green Builder. 
It's especially humbling pleasure to speak with you on the same program as so many of the other individuals that you'll be hearing from, including Jeremy Rifkin and, and Paul Hawken. Now, my invitation, unlike theirs, was not motivated by my recognized genius in engineering or biology or uh, physics or economics. It was motivated by politics. So let me begin with the most important political graph for climate change in the United States of America today. And it is this. The attitudes of younger Americans, and actually all Americans, when it comes to climate change and what causes it. For the first time, according to Gallup, and they've asked this question many years in a row now, for the first time, a majority of Americans in every single age cohort now believes that climate change is actually caused by human activity. And get this, among Americans under 30, 85% believe that climate change is caused by human behavior. When I showed you this same graph last year, it was only 72%, only. If you wanna know where a nation's headed, talk to her young men and women under 30 because you will rarely find among them climate change deniers. Uh, instead, you'll find that the vast majority believe we should be doing more, not less. The mind, once enlightened, cannot again become dark. Thomas Paine. In 2015, I became the first candidate for president in either of the major parties to propose a 100% clean electric grid for the United States of America by 2050. The difference between a dream and a goal is a deadline. And that goal actually became part of the Democratic Party's platform for the first time ever in 2016. And that's what Sarah's asked me to talk about today. Now there is today a lot more research literature and modeling available online about how we might get there than there was, believe it or not, just like two and a half years ago. Climate change is the greatest business opportunity to come to the United States in 100 years. And seizing this opportunity is going to require intention and follow through. Things that as Americans, we uh, have a hard time believing our national government is still capable of, but we are. It requires both a, largest, a larger consensus of understanding, and it also requires a new way of leadership. Everything that we love is at stake. And just because we've lost temporarily leadership in the White House doesn't mean we've lost leadership by Americans. And you see so much of that here today. Our individual and our collective actions as citizens of our city, citizens of our, of our states, is going to have to carry this ball for the next few plays. As Vice President Gore observes, this is a global opportunity combining the scale of the Industrial Revolution with the speed of the information age. Energy technologies are changing fast, global energy markets changing fast, and a new energy narrative is also emerging. And it too is emerging fast. And these trends are larger than any single presidential election outcome, even in a powerful country like ours. In fact, the winning fuels of this new energy future have already been determined. By 2030, renewable energy, primarily solar, wind, and hydro, as so many of you know, will be the world's primary power source. And smart money and smart people will invest where the future is going, will skate to where the puck is going. Others will cling to the declining profits of a fading past. For us, two large questions remain. First, as human beings, can we make the technical transition to 100% renewable energy happen quickly enough to avoid the climate disaster with all of the human suffering that goes with it? And second, as Americans, can we seize the opportunities of this transition for all of the job creation, health, and security benefits possible? The first question is a challenge of engineering. The second is a challenge of politics and governing. And the answer to both of those questions is an emphatic yes. We have the ability. The great variable, especially in a democracy, is understanding, right? 
Understanding among us and between us as a people. Understanding made manifest not only in the development of new technologies, but in the development of new policies and the implementation and the follow through. Our destination's clear, couldn't be clearer. In fact, it's, it's been made uh, uh, very, very clear over the course of this last year. Now we have to determine the speed at which we get there. So let's look at the road ahead, shall we? I first want to talk about the macro trends. Uh, the science is clear. We need a two-fold strategy. We have to not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions down to zero, but then we have to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Leveling off is not enough. And Paul Hawken later today will talk about Project Drawdown. Uh, I've been honored to have played a small uh, part in on their board. It is a uh, crowdsource work of planetary healing, which shows us the many ecosystemic ways we can get to that point where we're drawing more carbon out of the atmosphere every day than we're pumping into it. But for the next several minutes, I want to focus on just one key aspect of that great work that all of us share, and that is how that necessary transition to an emission-free, 100% renewable energy grid. You know, in a succinct talk in Colorado last year, Joe Rome said with the humility that comes from from learning and intellectual curiosity. He said, I can't tell you the timing of everything that is going to happen, but I can tell you what is going to happen. So let's look at a few of those macro trends of what is going to happen because in fact, they already are. 2017 showed the global clean energy revolution is unstoppable. Building and running new renewable energy is now cheaper than running old coal and nuclear plants. The price of solar has been reduced by 80% in the last 10 years. Battery prices have been cut in half just since 2014. David Roberts of Vox reports, models stubbornly keep favoring nuclear and CCS over PV, but the real world stubbornly keeps favoring solar over nuclear and CCS. Actual performance shows solar PV wildly outperforming most other predictive modeling runs, even providing 30 to 50 percent of global electricity eventually. When it comes to wind, after dropping 65 percent between 2009 and today, wind power costs should drop another 50 percent by 2030. That would make wind competitive with natural gas almost everywhere in America without subsidies. Right now, solar and wind are actually cheaper than gas plants. Soon, renewable energy will dominate our energy mix. And according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, coal and gas begin their terminal decline within less than a decade. Oil begins its terminal decline in 2030. The price of electricity storage, especially lithium batteries, is being brought down sharply. The rising production and declining cost of electric cars means within 10 years there should be no need for gasoline in the urban drive cycle. Pretty amazing stuff. That black line here shows you uh, the anticipated trajectory of when electric cars surpass uh, the gas-powered cars we've been using. With the rise of electric cars, second-use batteries will become a big new market. By the time we get to 2050, a 50 kilowatt battery with a 10-year warranty will be on the market. And it would appear that the bridge fuel to a zero emission future is not so much natural gas, but rather clean technology, clean building technology, living homes, living buildings that create more energy and feedback to the grid. LED light bulbs were an expensive 1% in the market just a few years ago. With a 90% reduction in price, they will soon be an affordable 100% of the market. That's some pretty rapid change. And all of this means electricity demand, at least according to Joe Rome, in the United States is essentially flat. It's not only according to Joe, it's according to history. But Joe believes it'll remain flat even with population growth due to green building technology, LEDs, rooftop solar, and other innovations uh, too numerous to mention and some not yet imagined. In the past, the variability of sunshine, sunshine and wind 
made it hard to conceive of steady supply of 100% renewable. But today, from a technology and engineering standpoint, and this is big, the issues of variability and integration have essentially been solved. Only deployment issues remain. Together, rapid improvements in battery technology and widespread adoption of electric cars will totally solve the integration and variability challenge of solar PV. And with the development of super fast charging technology for batteries, uh, cars and homes themselves become a big part of the distributed storage capacity, such that, according to Bloomberg, solar and wind will make up nearly half of installed capacity and over one-third of global power generation by 2040, given current market trends. That's a pretty remarkable shift. That's the third industrial revolution that Jeremy was talking about, and it's happening right now. Imagine as Americans what we could do if we actually pushed a little bit, huh? If we actually broke a sweat. Uh, those are the latest trends. Let's look at some of the latest models. Uh, just last month, the Lappinranta University of Technology in Finland, if there are any Finns here, you can correct, correct my pronunciation. The Lappinranta University of Finland, on behalf of the Energy Watch Group, simulated a global transition to 100% renewable energy in the power sector by 2050. And the existing technologies they plugged into this energy system optimization model included electricity generation, electricity transmission, and storage. Not whiz-bang new stuff that nobody's invented yet, all technologies that are available today. And they concluded that not only is it possible, but it is less expensive than burning fossil fuels as usual. And it is the only model so far created that runs at full hourly resolution on a global to local scale. Real weather data are used for solar, wind, and hydro sources. And global models are interesting, yes, but they're not terribly useful. So let's look at what it says about the United States and our energy future. Our current energy system, uh, I'm going to fast forward here a little bit. Uh, current energy system, there we go. Current energy system is fueled, of, as you know, by fossil power plants, dominated right now anyway, with recent shifting from plants fired by coal to plants fired by natural gas, oftentimes unnaturally extracted. Um, and while renewable energy has increased, fossil plants, mostly gas, have increased slightly more just over the last few years. But all of that is about to change. Let me back up here. Renewable energy. United States of America, with its vast land area, from sea to shining sea has a vast amount of renewable energy resources. Uh, and there it is broken down in six different maps. Offshore wind capabilities particularly strong along the population centers of the east and the west coast. How convenient. Thank you, Lord. Uh, onshore wind is strongest in the central plains. Solar PV and wind will drive most of the future of the American system, while hydropower complements. Uh, and let me uh, click you through uh, the future as this model lays it out. Uh, but the last bullet there, by the way, is solar PV supply share increases from 1% in 2015 to about 54% in 2050, becoming the least costly source. So there we go. Ron was talking about the Chinese working in five-year increments. Chinese are good at the five-year plan. We Americans are good at the here and now. Uh, Forty years is a long time in the Bible. It's also a long time in the United States. But just look at what we can accomplish in 40, in 40 years. So this is 2015. You see the black here is uh, fossil coal. The purple is nuclear for those of you at the back of the room. The gray is fossil gas. Right now in 2015, you can barely see that little silver sliver of solar. This is 2020. 2030. 2035. 2040. 2045. 
2050. The supply share of solar PV steadily increases from 1% to 54%. New capacities of wind energy and solar PV, batteries becoming the most important supporting technology. Uh, and particularly for solar PV uh, prosumers, tens of millions of property owners who produce their own electricity and sell it back to the grid. Battery technology ramping up with battery storage used to balance load on a daily basis. And after an initial increase in investment, actual capital requirements under this model actually start to decline by 2025. With the level of cost of energy for the system declining from uh, $79 per megawatt to 64 from 2005 to 2050, including all generation, storage, curtailment, and parts of the new grid costs. And there's their matrix. Uh, that's, in, uh, that's actually in, in pounds. I did the conversion for you. The United States, uh, while this model did not have uh, a lot of wind in it, uh, other models do. Uh, uh, wind emerges in their model as the second largest source, contributing 37% of total energy generation. This one's from the GovX, uh, 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 GovX site. I spent a lot of time in Iowa. Look at Iowa in the middle there. Iowa's almost 40% renewable. That wasn't true. 15 years ago was what, like 3% or something? But uh, let me uninterrupt this map with my speaking and just watch it. You can say ooh and ah. Ooh. Ah. Pretty cool, huh? In addition to being more cost, um, uh, less costly and more efficient than our current fossil fuel system, a 100% renewa renewable energy system reduces greenhouse gas emissions down to zero by 2050. And look how, how, look at the gains in just 15 years into this. Other, commu other uh, uh, computer models have been created by our, by our own renewable energy lab in Golden, Colorado. Way, way back in 2012, they created a model with an 80% uh, uh, goal, and they came to similar conclusions, actually. And, uh, and they broke it down by region. Other models uh, uh, modeled the uh, grid build out for renewable, concluding that even the most ambitious of scenarios pays for itself with the two and a half times the return of benefit compared to cost. Other models available online at the Renewable Energy Lab website show how a dynamic renewable grid would pulsate across the hours of high demand, uh, given a, get a, a week in the middle of the summer with all its peaks and valleys. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Energy transition is no longer a question of technical feasibility or economic viability, but of political will. Which brings me to my second question. And th that second question is this. You know, can we forge the political will? Can we summon up the governing capacity necessary to actually be intentional, set goals, follow up, get it done, and maintain the, uh, the consensus necessary to reach that destination that is so very clear for us on the horizon? Um, as clear as our destination is, that also makes the policy choices clear. Uh, and they are, as best I can break them down, to realign utility profit incentive away from energy consumption and forward to the maintenance of a secure, reliable, and dynamic grid. Two, to shift subsidies incentives and incentives from fossil fuels, including uh, 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 two renewables, and three, to invest in the research and the development that forwards our renewable energy future. In the United States of America, it is states and cities that traditionally drive energy policy, not the White House. Uh, all of the Paris commitments for emissions reductions in the U.S., that is a 26 to 28 percent reduction uh, by, from 2005 levels by 2025, all of those things can be met by the combined actions of cities 
and states. What kind of actions? Uh, actions like the 19 states that have now adopted greenhouse gas reduction targets, the 20 states that have adopted decoupling policies, the 26 states that have now adopted mandatory renewable energy portfolio standards, and many of them inspired by current actions in the White House to raise those standards. 22 states have now adopted energy efficiency standards and targets. 26 have now adopted residential building energy codes. Four have recently adopted higher standards, and I might be losing, losing track at the pace with which people are, and states are doing these things. And 41 states now have adopted net metering policies so homeowners can actually sell back to the grid. Cities and states, as you heard Chris Castro mentioned earlier, all across the country are passing legislation. They're enacting ordinances to, to honor the Paris Agreement's carbon reduction targets with action. American cities and states are joining forces together in the United States Climate Alliance from Los Angeles to uh, California, to Atlanta, Georgia, uh, to um, uh, Orlando, Florida, to Somerville, Massachusetts. Americans understand the urgency of this challenge, the immensity of, of the opportunity, and these cities are moving to make their own operations uh, to 100 uh, percent renewables. Many states, as I said, have raised their standards. I think California's is 50 percent now, yes. Other states are raising their goals and accelerating their actions. Uh, Hawaii, uh, 100 percent uh, by 2045. In fact, given the cost of shipping into an island, Hawaii will probably, well, you know, will probably be the first state to get to 100% renewable, uh, but they will not be the last. In a few days, in New Jersey, the people of New Jersey will inaugurate and swear in a new governor. In the wake of former Governor Christie's backtracking on climate action, and boy, I love saying former Governor Christie, Murphy campaigned on moving New Jersey forward to a 100% renewable energy grid by 2050. And he won overwhelming margins, especially among people who live in cities, especially among young people who have an even greater stake than, than, than many of us in the immediate future of this planet. Texas will soon reach 25% in its energy mix. Iowa, fast approaching 40%. This year, a whopping 36 states, I'm switching the channel now back to politics, a whopping 36 states will be electing new governors and new legislatures all across the United States. This is one of those, those years that only happens once every four, and sometimes they happen right before congressional redistricting. So as these elections go this year, will determine whether or not we're able to create a more representative House of Representatives in the immediate future. So, um, and one day, one day, perhaps sooner rather than later, America will have a new president. One day, one day, as surely as the sun rises in the east, he or she will embrace the challenge and the opportunity of climate change and climate action for all that's at stake for the United States and the world. Now, I will not bore you or bum you out with a recitation of what our next president should not do. Backing out of Paris, Keystone Pipeline, Arctic drilling, offshore drilling, opening up federal lands to coal mining. I'm not going to do that. We all witnessed that over the course of the last year. We all witnessed those reversals. Uh, most of the easy executive policy undoings have already been undone. And you know what? They can all be done again. That's the beauty of our uh, electoral process. Sometimes uh, great republics make bad mistakes, but the good ones correct them quickly. And now it's a new year, isn't it? Turn to your neighbor. Tell them it's a new year. Go ahead. Do it there. It's a new year. So let's look forward, not back, shall we? Darkness makes a great canvas. And we've got a lot of light to create here. Looking forward, our next elected president will, number one, 
actually campaign on the opportunity of climate change, will actually lay out for the people of the United States those policies which serve our national interest and those which do not. And because of this truthfulness and trust in the intelligence and the goodness of the American people, he or she will actually get elected. How you campaign, how you campaign determines how you can govern. Campaigns need to be more than Twitter storms or infotainment or a rolling exchange of cash for ambassadorships, right? Campaigns are, are, are how we build a governing consensus to get things done. Number two, on day one, our next elected president will sign an executive order declaring a full transition to clean energy to be the number one economic and national security priority of our federal government. Number three, our next elected president will charge NASA with the mission of leading a cross-disciplinary and cross-departmental process whose job it shall be within 100 days to lay out a national model which simulates the fastest and most cost-effective way for the, to move the United States to a 100% renewable grid by 2050. We did not land a man on the moon with an all of the above strategy. Market forces alone did not propel the Apollo missions. We did. This is an engineering problem. It's an engineering challenge, one that NASA has the unique combination at this point in our history of both talent and public credibility to actually lead. All subsequent actions flow from these first three. Among them, budgets to fully fund the Environmental Protection Agency and a new Clean Jobs Corps. Tripling from Obama era, I've still got a lot more to do. Tripling <laughs> from Obama era levels, our national investment in research and development for clean energy, smart grid, and battery storage technology. Capital investments in the power lines necessary to connect offshore wind to the major population centers of our coasts and connect onshore wind to the major population centers of, Americans, of America's heartland. Now to those who say that our nation cannot afford such investments, I pause here to redirect your attention to the 1.5 trillion in tax cuts Congress just passed for corporations, the already wealthy, and the already dead. Tripling R&D for America's clean energy future would amount to just 12.8% of that 1.5 trillion. Fully funding EPA and a new clean energy jobs core would amount to 8% of that 1.5 trillion. And for 10 billion a year, a whole range of national clean grid transmission projects could be financed and built for a mere 6% of what we just spent on those tax cuts for corporations, the already wealthy and the already dead. And unlike those tax cuts, these projects will actually create 2.7 million jobs, according to a study by CAP and, and Amherst. So please, don't tell me we cannot afford it. We can afford what we want to afford. We cannot afford not to. There is one more nascent, but really important trend that we need to see and we need to lift up in our country. It is a development that's essential for restoring the public trust necessary to meet the challenges ahead, especially for democracies, especially in the digital age. You know, the old ways of governing, ideology, bureaucracy, hierarchy, like our reliance on fossil fuels, those things are fading away. And a new way of governing is emerging. It's sometimes hard to see. It's like in a new song that's playing more softly, but it calls for a new way of leadership at every level. There was a time just 10 to 15 years ago when the best place for an effective leader was to be high atop that pyramid of command and control. 
controlling information, controlling authority, and the rule of that bygone day was the rule of because I said so. Today in the information age, the most important place for an effective leader is in the center of a collaborative circle, a collaborative circle that is focused on the emerging truth. And in this age, where information can be mapped and shared by all in an instant, the new rule for getting things done is the rule of because I can show you it actually works. It actually serves our national interests. It actually increases prosperity, opportunity, and well-being more than the old way of doing things. And this new way of governing, I am glad to report, after traveling all over the country for these last few years, has actually taken root now in those small places close to home. Actually, some of them are no longer quite so small. They're called cities or towns all across the United States and in many places around the world. And this new way of leadership and getting things done in the information age and democracies is actually radiating up and it's radiating out from these places. It is fundamentally entrepreneurial. It requires a radical commitment to openness and transparency every day, not through words, but through actions. It is collaborative. It is relentlessly performance measured and its operating method is a rapid cadence of accountability. Short, regular meetings with stakeholders focus on the actions that will affect and change that latest emerging truth. And it is enabled by common platforms and models, essentially the internet, geographic information systems, and uh, systems that for the first time make this work actually open and visible for all of us to see. What kind of models? I'm talking about models that show us where and when crime is most likely to be committed and how to prevent it over any place, over a, uh, an, an eight hour shift. Models that show us when and where traffic flows and how to better accommodate it. Models that show us how nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment flow. Pollution comes into the veins of a six state watershed like the Chesapeake Bay and how we can take actions to actually increase the health of the bay. Uh, models that show us how we produce energy today and how we can move to 100% renewable energy tomorrow. Models that tell us whether or not our actions are sufficient to achieve our goals. Make no mistake about it. A new energy narrative is emerging. There are solutions. There is broad and growing public support. Market and technology trends have never been more favorable. This one from Generation 180. My kids love our solar panels. I'm securing our nation's future. I never go to the gas station. I work in the solar industry. I generate my own power. But accelerating America's transition to 100% renewable grid is going to require actions, not words. Those actions include attacks on carbon emissions from all sources, with revenues returned to middle class families and those aspiring to be middle class, revenues invested in job transition assistance and pension portability, for those that are losing their jobs and in past energy industries and new jobs with the Clean Energy Jobs Corps. Other actions include the creations of instruments and, fra and frameworks like feed-in tariffs to accelerate the widespread adoption of distributed renewable energy production, a phase-out of all subsidies to fossil fuel extraction, including subsidies made at the expense of our public health or of our public lands an increase of royalties and emissions fees on operations currently drilling on federal lands, and divestment of pension funds from fossil fuel profits. This is the future. And as Americans, we don't fear the future, we make it ours. We shall increase tax exemptions and tax credits for investments in renewable energy. We shall advance the building of a modern distributed grid. We shall embrace innovations in finance like blockchain that allow distributed energy production to be facilitated by distributed energy trading. We shall use the islands of Hawaii and Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa and Guam as early beta cases for this movement to 100% renewable energy grid, a goal which some other island people uh, have already essentially reached or are on the way to reaching. 
We shall support cities, states, and universities and their drive to zero emissions. We shall learn from the innovations of humanity the world over, and we will not stop until we get there. Conclusion. Conclusion. As Americans, we act in the present not because we fear the future, but because we believe that we can make it better. Urbanization and the drive for a more sustainable future are now joined together in one urgent movement of human development. And congratulations, you're right in the middle of it. And this planet and future generations and our country has never needed you more than we, they all do right now. The internet, our ability to model our natural and built environments, our ability to share technologies in ways that actually accelerate that learning curve. No prior generation in humanity has ever had this ability. All we need to confront this challenge now is our own hands. Our politics, like our self-confidence, is badly bruised, but we have the ability to make it work again. Our destination is clear. It's time to leave behind the small-mindedness, the self-pitying excuses, and fear of the future. It's time to speak to the goodness within us as a people, to call that goodness forward. For as a great man once said, there is an absolute direction to growth, and life moves in that direction, and life is never mistaken about its road or its destination. It tells us towards what point on the horizon we must steer if we are to see the dawn's light grow more intense. Thank you.